does it mean to you? Can I nominate? <laughs> Herbert, what does Spam Sunday, what does it mean? Spam uh, Sunday reminds me of um, the beginning of the journey of my savior. Um, it reminds me of the significance of that journey in my life and how it was the to my life. Praise the Lord. That was the beginning of the process of Jesus going to the cross to liberate us. One more volunteer. Janet? Thank you. So it, it reminds us of, of, of Jesus, why he came and why we have hope today. For everything that happened culminating in, in his being killed on the cross had been prophesied many, many years before he came. And as we said last week, it's a good time to remind ourselves to bring it fresh, to bring it back, just like we do at Christmas. You know, at Christmas, we all celebrate the first coming of the, of the king, of the creator in the flesh. And the whole world celebrates Christmas with us. Hello? Yeah. At least they're supposed to be celebrating Christmas with us, even though it's been commercialized in many ways. But praise God, the time is being redeemed because nobody can deny that Jesus is the creator of the universe. And he is the one who came to save us. And Easter gives us that opportunity as well. And as we look towards Easter in our own community, in our environment, you know, the, uh, the Council of Churches in Boron Wood, we have put together this work of witness, which we will be doing on Friday. And I want to ask every one of us, no matter what you are doing on Friday, please spare a couple of hours from 11 o'clock till about one o'clock to come and witness for your king. Just like, you know, when we started the service, we were told that people were putting their clothes and things on the floor just to let the king ride on the donkey. We don't have to throw our things on the floor, but we can stand and testify and just show that this is where we stand. You know, it is, when you see people uh, gathering at Trafalgar Square trying to, <clears throat> trying to demonstrate about the cause, there's a reason for that because that's what they're passionate about. And if you and I are passionate about Christ, we need to show up. And I want to say that every one of us, I'll be looking around, I'll carry um, a register to make sure that you are there. And if you are not there, no breakfast on Sunday. <laughs> I know some of us will gladly take that, but please, we want you to please come out just to show that you belong to this king. You know, I, there's, there's no need to hide about Jesus. You know, one of the things that, I, that never ceases to amaze me when I, when I think about my own life is that in those days, when I was young and fearless and I felt the whole world belonged to me, I would do things. I remember one time we used to demonstrate against government, even in the face of bullets. And we would, we would demonstrate because we didn't like what the government was doing and we wanted to change the government. And we would be on the street, we would be on the street, not minding our lives, even with life bullets aiming at you, because we believe that, you know, we must change this government. Exactly, we, we had conviction. But now after we become Christians, we kind of stay cool, you know, it's, some of us don't even want to come to church. Okay, you don't want to go on the street. You don't want to evangelize. You don't want to tell people about the love of Christ. When you go to, if you go to Tesco's and you, you're speaking to someone, you mention Jesus and say, what are you talking about? You disappear. No, no, that's the time you should raise your voice, not to shout, but to let them know who you belong to. Because Jesus is worth being celebrated. 
Jesus is worth being represented, and we should take any opportunity we have. So I'm believing God that all of us will turn out on this Friday and we'll be asked to wear red. Incidentally, the only red thing I have is a tie, and I'm not going to wear a tie on the day. So I'm looking for a red shirt, <laughs> T-shirt or whatever. We must come out in red. Because red, I think it symbolizes blood, something like that. And life is in the blood. Life is in the blood. Is it the reason why the blood is so important is because that represents life. You know that scripture that Sam read from John 6 that says, unless you eat of his flesh and you drink of his blood, you don't have a part in him. You don't even have life in him. So it's so important for, for us to identify with this king. And I'm looking forward to being out on Friday, Lord willing. Amen? So please, brethren, let's come out. Let's represent our king and let's witness for him. Let's give out tracts, you know, and let's show people that there is an oasis here that is waiting to welcome them, to accommodate them, to minister life and hope to them. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, getting back to the mission of today. We're going to be looking uh, further into what we started last week. We, we spoke about what Jesus did on the cross, the divine exchange that took place on the cross. And we looked at the fact that he didn't die for his own crime. He died for you and for me. And that is why we have hope today. And what happened on the cross was that the evil that was due to us because of our sin and rebellion was placed on Jesus so that the good that was due to him because of his obedience became ours. And some of the things we looked at last week was that he was punished that we might be forgiven. Aren't you glad about that? So when someone is not given a ticket, it's because the price has been paid. Amen? I can testify. I mean, traffic offenses, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just in the eye of the world. But what about the sin in your life? Sin of rebellion against God. Sin of pride, pride of life all the sins that we, we've committed, he took that sin upon himself that we can graciously receive his forgiveness, God's forgiveness. Aren't you glad about that? If you have nothing else to shout about, that's enough to shout about. Because we, we were sinners, but we've been forgiven because of the price that Jesus paid. He was wounded that we might be healed. And I can testify of the goodness of God in that area. You know, we were, he was made sin so that we could become righteous. You know, righteousness is something that we must wear in our heart and wear properly. Because righteousness means you've been made right with God. Imagine you are God's enemy. Because we were born in Adam. Every human being who was born into this world is born into the sin that's of rebellion. And if you, if you don't agree with me, watch those little young people. When they're young, they're innocent. But when they begin, to, when they begin to, to decide between right and wrong, good and bad, you begin to see the manifestation of the sin of Adam. The, good, the word that most kids like to say is the word, no. <laughs> no. Praise God. He tasted death so that you and I can live. And eternal life means to have God's life for all of eternity, to stay in God's presence for all of eternity. And it actually means to know God and to know Jesus Christ. That's what eternal life is. You know, he was made a curse that we might receive the blessing. And that is going to be the theme of our talk today. But let me just drop one more. He was rejected. He was rejected. He was rejected that you can find acceptance. 
So my being accepted by God today, you see, when we say he's a good, good father, when you say good father, that means for you to sing that, to be able to sing that with, with proper understanding, it means that you are his child. But it didn't come easy. It took Jesus to, to die the cruel death he died for you to be accepted to become one of God's children. He was rejected. You know, when he had to cry, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? It was because he had to pay the ultimate price for the sin of humanity. And because of that, you and I can, we have an open arms into God's house. We have become God's children. And we should never take that for granted. So as we are reminded in this season of Easter, there's one more task about that. Let that become something you live by every day. And everyone that comes across your path, let them know that that is who you are. You see, the Bible says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. In John, Romans 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. We should never be ashamed of the gospel. In fact, if you are ashamed of Jesus, he has already said, he's in the angels of God, they, they will talk, God will reject you if you are ashamed of him. Amen? And so we have an opportunity to always declare the goodness of God to our life, in our lives. So today, moving on from last week, we're going to be looking at the fact that Jesus became a curse that we might receive the blessing of God. And our text is from Galatians 3, two verses. Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, everyone who is hung on a tree is cursed. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham will come to the Gentiles by Christ Jesus, so that we could receive the promised spirit through faith. I'll read that again. Christ Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, everyone who is hung on a tree is cursed. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham will come to the Gentiles by Christ Jesus so that we could receive the promised spirit through faith. Heavenly Father, I just pray, O oh God, that you reveal something of this word to every one of us today. Let us realize that Jesus took it upon himself, the curse that was due to us because of our disobedience, because of our, our rebellion, because of our idolatry, he took the curse upon himself so that we can be beneficiaries of your blessing. And I pray that if anyone is in doubt of what happened then over 2,000 years ago, that today that the Holy Spirit revealed to each one of us, let us have that conviction, that understanding, that revelation, that we do not have to live under any curse because Jesus himself became that curse that we might be set free but that we also might receive the blessing of God. May that blessing be real to us, real in our lives, oh God. And may we live in the good of it for the rest of our days. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, blessings and curses are important phrases. Because if you, if you read the Old Testament, you'll find that it, those are the distinctive marks. If I'm just remembering one person right now, Jabez. Some of us will be familiar with the story of Jabez. Jabez was a man who was born and he was named Sorrow. That is of automatic damnation because you no know, names are kind of prophetic. So when he was named Sorrow, because his mom went through pain in giving birth to him. So he was under a curse. But as he came, I realized that this was what was happening to him. The Bible said he pleaded with God. 
he cried to God and said, God, please deliver me from this curse. I don't have to live the rest of my days carrying the tag sorrow. You may not appreciate that because we live in modern day <laughs> Britain because names don't mean too much. Well, imagine if when you, they call your name, they're actually prophesying your future to you. And they say your name is sorrow, pain. How would you like to be called that? No good. So he realized that and he had to ask God to remove that. Because curses and blessings are words that are charged with supernatural power. When a curse is pronounced, it's charged with supernatural power. And curses can be usually come from God or from the enemy, the devil. It can be from an agent of God or a demonic agent. But they have supernatural effects if they are pronounced from those two sources. And so they have power, either the power of God or the power of the enemy. They are words which impinge upon people's lives and to a large extent determine their destiny. That's why we must take this seriously. And that was what Jesus was doing when he came, when he was hanging on the cross. The curse, because curses come as a, in, in God's economy due to disobedience. If you want to see the full import of that, if you read Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 to 68, the first few verses, verses 1 to 14, describe what the blessing life looks like. A life that is blessed, a life that is fruitful, a life that is productive, a life that is a head, not a tail, a life that is prospering. But then when you read from verse 15 to 68, there's a catalog of curses that come on mankind due to disobedience. It is not something to read in the night. you will have nightmares if you do that, <laughs> okay? Because, and more importantly, when you read through those verses, you know the first thing that jumps at you, I don't want this. I don't want a life of curses. But imagine Jesus by coming, he decided that all the curses that were due to mankind because of our rebellion against God, to put it upon him, him so that you and I could be set free. So the legal part is that he has paid the price. He has paid the price. So there are two sides to it. There's the legal side, but there's the experiential side. You know, a lot of times when you see a prisoner, when, when, when let's say someone is in prison and, you know, they take them to court and whatever, the judge can pronounce judgment and say they are free or, or whatever. But the prisoner still has to experience that judgment, good or bad. So in our case, Jesus already paid the price. So no more curses for believers. Okay, well, do you want, I do believe that there are a lot of Christians who are living under the curse. There are many reasons for it, but the two principal reasons are lack of knowledge, ignorance, and the second reason is disobedience. Because to qualify for things of God, you need to walk in obedience. Because nothing just happens. And we believers, that's why as we are reminded of this, we need to check, do sort of like stock taking. How am I faring? It's not to put you into condemnation. It's just to make sure that are you living in the reality of all that Jesus has done for you? Or you are, or you, because of ignorance or because of disobedience, you are missing out. And God doesn't want any one of us to miss out. 
Never. Otherwise, what is the point of Jesus coming? To die, a cruel death. If we will still be suffering under the weight of curses that have been pronounced on humanity. But when we don't understand the process of enjoying the goodness of God, because one thing God hates is putting other gods ahead of him. You know, that was why the children of Israel, they suffered and suffered and suffered because instead of following God, they wanted to follow the God of the other people or the gods of the other people. And time and time again, God will send his prophets and he will send his, his people to, to them to correct them. They seem to like the broad road, the broad way. And is it not true of today? The road to hell is broad. And a lot of people, that is the road that they prefer. But you and I, as children of God, we need to choose the narrow road. The road that trusts only God. Even if the whole world says, I'm going this way, you have got to map out a different pathway. Because the road that goes with God is the road of blessings. But the whole world is under the penalty and the judgment. Because God is a just God. The reason why Jesus had to endure everything and he wasn't let off was because God is perfect and is just. Because whenever I, whenever I get into my emotions, I'm meditating on the cross and I'm saying, why did he have to go through this? Was that no easy way? If he had taken the easier way, easy way, you and I would not be here. Because the eternal one, the holy one, had, he had to let the cause be run. And when he did it, and he said, it is finished, it means all the penalty, because what he did was that he took upon himself our sin and the punishment or consequence of those sins. Everything was put upon him. And when he had taken them upon himself and he had carried out God's intention, he said it was finished. And which meant it was completely complete. Nothing could be added to it. Nothing could be taken away from it. And the grace of God and the mercy of God was perfected on that cross. And what God is saying is that it's now your turn to tap into it. And the way to tap into it is by faith. Because the only way you can enjoy everything that God has done for you through Jesus Christ is to activate your faith. And faith simply means trusting that what God has said is true. And it's not just true for the whole world, it's true for you. It's true for me. For God so loved the world that he gave. But if I don't make it personal, it will never amount to much with me. You have to make it personal. One of the songs I really love is My Jesus, My Savior, because it brings it home. It's my Jesus, it's my Savior. I know he's the Savior of the world, but has he become my own Savior? Has he become my own Lord? Because until that happens, I'm just singing songs. We have got to make this our own. We're all children of God, but are you a child of God? Because there are many people who come to church who are not Christians. The devil himself comes to church. He just doesn't have much space. 
to operate. He comes to make people asleep. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. When you see division in churches, there's only one culprit, it's the devil. Amen? And we've got to be aware of all these things. So the important thing is that we have to personalize the revelations that we have from the word of God about the divine exchange that happened on the cross. So that forgiveness, is forgiving the whole world, or have you tapped into that forgiveness? And when we talk about the area of curses, you know, one, the, the way I, 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 I process this in my own mind is the fact that Jesus has already removed the curse from me. And I have been brought into the blessing. And I tell you, it's more blessed. It's, it's, it's better to be blessed than to be cursed. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so when I look at what areas of my life are still lacking in enjoying the goodness of God, because as I said, if you look at Deuteronomy 28, you will find some common, common uh, things that run through. The, 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 the effect of the curse are things like sin, sickness, poverty, failure, oppression, servitude, you know, just being under constant oppression of the devil. I know that one time that Jesus, Jesus had to say to the devil, he said today he's coming, but he has nothing in him. You and I should be bold to be able to say that all the time with the revelation and understanding we have. Because the devil has no right to mess you up. But if he's messing you up, is that you, because you're allowing it? Or because, or because you don't know that he's not supposed to mess you up? The Bible says, God has given us authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. And nothing shall by enemies hurt us. But some of us are so afraid of the devil that we don't tell him what he needs to hear to get lost. Remember the story I, I gave a few weeks, weeks ago about Spring Eagle's word, about the woman that was, had this little puppy who was, the puppy was just playing games, didn't want to go back and say, the woman said, get! And then Spring Eagle's word shouted, that's how we ought to treat the devil. Because we need to put him where he belongs, under our foot. Amen? Amen. But he, because he's operating, because he, he, he preys on our ignorance. So the assignment for us today is you are going to go back into your Bible. You're going to read, particularly, it's one place that this is condensed. Determine 28. You're going to read through the whole chapter. It's 68 verses. Some of you may need a whole day to read that. The first time I read it, it took me five days because I kept getting stuck. Because every time I read a particular phrase, I'm saying, particularly the, the blessing part, I am not experiencing this. I'm wondering why not? Well, I thought I was bad enough when I got to the curses part. Oh boy. I now understood what the children of Israel went through. But because they were so ignorant, God got them out of Egypt, but Egypt remained in them firmly. And that's what we have to do. We have to expel and expunge Egypt out of our lives. We need to look at the promises of God and decide, this is for me. This is not for me. This is for me. This is not for me. And whatever is not for you, what do you do? You reject it. And I believe that some of us can do a good work ourselves. I remember when this first became a revelation to me. I was a Christian, and I've been a Christian for a number of years. But I was, there were a lot of things that were not adding together. And so when I realized that perhaps there were things even that my ancestors had done that were still affecting me, that I needed to get rid of, and I sat squarely with it, I began to see a change. 
Because God wants us to go to school to get proper information, to deal with these issues, and to walk in freedom. Because it's God's intent, because of what Jesus did, for each one of us to walk in total victory in our lives. He doesn't want you to be under any weight, any cloud of, of the enemy, of darkness. And you know, that's why the cross is so important. Christ was hanging on that cross so that he could redeem us from the curse of the law. And you see, the, the point there is that if you are from Israel at the time, because there's a, there's a, there's a statute in the Bible, Deuteronomy 21, that said that anyone who was put on a cross, on, on a tree, is cursed by God. So they understood, the people of, of Israel who knew the Torah at that time, when they saw Jesus hanging on the cross, they knew what had happened. He was accursed of God. But not for his own sake, for our own sake. And so the bad that was due to us, he took it upon himself. And he now wants us to have the good. Being free from the curse is the good that came out of Jesus hanging on the cross. So you ask me, how do I make that my own? You asked right. Because first of all, you need to walk in obedience. You need to walk by faith. Because the scripture we read said that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us. Now, the blessing of Abraham, when I was a little young Christian, we all, Abraham's blessings are mine, and so on and so forth. But did you know that the blessing came on Abraham because he was obedient to God's ways? God said he was blessing him because he was obedient. And if you read Genesis 12, you will find it's a seven-step process of how God blessed Abraham. But the root was his obedience. When God said to him to leave his land of earth, to go to a place he will show him, he left. And it qualified for God's blessing. So you and I, the first place is to put your trust in Jesus. If you really want to enjoy the blessing of God, you need to put your absolute trust in Jesus. Not Jesus and another thing. Hello? Not Jesus and your wish. Not Jesus and the country. It's going to be put in Jesus. You have to forget about your old ways and embrace the new life in Christ. And then you have to do your best to work out your faith with fear and trembling, which means be constantly trust God. Obey his commands. Now, does it mean that you go back to the 600 plus laws in the Old Testament and begin to tick them and begin to say, I obey this, I obey this? No, 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 no. If you could do that, you're a champion. But I can promise you, you cannot make it. Is to trust God. And whatever light you have in the word of God, you're going to walk by that light. Like I was explaining last week, some of us, the area of unforgiveness. When God says, forgive others so that you can be forgiven. Some of us want to be forgiven, but we don't want to forgive others. It doesn't add up. If you want God to forgive you, you've got to forgive those who have wronged you. And someone will ask, how many times do they have to wrong me for me to forgive them? Peter had an answer from Jesus. Countless times. You have to forgive people so that you can receive God's forgiveness. And if you yourself fall into sin, you have to apply 1 John 1. What does it say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
So you need to make this practical. You need to walk in the light that you find, which means you have to live in the Bible. Hello? You need to know the word of God. Not in head knowledge, but ask for revelation. The psalmist says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous works from your word. Psalm 119. Which means, let God open your eyes and give you revelation that you need for the hour. You see, one of the good things I know about God is how perfect he is in our lives. Some of us, when we are not supposed to be in grade five, he doesn't give us grade five exams. Perhaps you are just at grade one, the test he will give you will be grade one text. But when you have gone to grade five and you are still messing around around grade one, you are in trouble. Which means he's shown you some light and now you want to choose the other side. So you have to be progressive with God because he doesn't want you to keep repeating those exams. When he has shown you something, when he shows you about love, you see, which is the, 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 the paramount law, God wants us to love people. I know love has different dimensions. I'm talking about agape love, the God kind of love, unconditional love, that doesn't look at how the person looks before you decide I want to love them. You know, are they my type? Before you choose to love them. Even with Christian evangelism, we can be discriminatory. We've got to be careful. Because God wants you to express the love of God to everyone it brings across your path. And every precept, everything that God has laid down for us, he wants us to begin to bring those things into our lives. But in the area of these curses and blessings, as I said, the things that God has given us, like Deuteronomy 28 will be just a reference point. But the general principle is obedience gets you into enjoying the blessing. Disobedience leads you to be under the curse. But because you have been set free from the curse, you have no business. You have no business living in the land of the curse. And so what we have to do is to train ourselves, is to find a, every possible way to say, God, when you show me, I want to obey you. When we came into church this morning, God told me to say something. He said, John was in the Isle of Patmos. And on the Lord's day, the Lord said to him in Revelation 4, come up higher. And he says, he's telling ICF Boron Wood to come up higher. Yeah. To come up higher Amen. in revelation. Come up higher in understanding. Come up higher in your commitment. Come on higher in your intimacy with God. Because that is the land that God has already, that is the territory that God wants you to operate from. The place where you, you see, when John went up higher, he said he saw the throne. He saw the throne. If you have seen the throne, you cannot live in the, in the mire anymore. But you need to get out of the level where you're at to come to the level where you can actually see God seated on his throne. Because when you behold a lamb upon on his, on his throne, it changes everything. And that is the call that God is having for all of us right now, to come up higher, to come up higher. He's saying that he's taking away your shame. He's taking away your rejection. He's taking away your sin. He's removed all these curses that were due to you. But he wants you to come into space where his blessing are yours. You know, when David was able to say, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. 
He was a man that had come up higher. You know, David was a man that amazed me anytime I read the story. I read the story. You know, when David was should have, should have been should have killed Saul, and he didn't do that, and everybody was wondering why. He made a statement: "I'm not going to kill the Lord's anointed." And the same David, when his son wanted to kill him, he was hiding. And I was wondering, why was he hiding away from Absalom? You know what he said? He said, God put me on this throne. Maybe he was mad with me. And it was time for me to be removed. Because he understood who the real king was. So God wants us to stop being on the throne of our own lives. He wants to be the one be thrown on our, on our lives. He wants to be enthroned in our hearts. And that is where we can worship him with freedom, with all, because God is awesome. Awesome means he's fair so. When you behold him on his throne, you will know that you are dealing with the ultimate. Some of us, even if, if you have to go into Buckingham Palace, you have to follow different protocols before you get there. And it's not going to be easy. First of all, you need to dress right. You need to, to behave right. But imagine the creator of the universe, the holy God. Holy. Holy is his name. You want to approach him. You've got to approach him in the right and proper way. That means, first of all, but what it demands of you is to come by faith and to come with obedience. He's made it so easy for us. Two weeks ago, we were looking at the, 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 the Passover. One thing that struck me was that, and someone was making that remark later on, that some of us, life has become so easy, yet we still don't make the most of this easy life. Imagine you had to go through all those things before you can even approach God. But he's made it so easy. He says, trust him. Trust him. Trust him. And walk in obedience. Is that difficult? Hello? Shouldn't be. But we can make it easy for ourselves by learning to trust God, no matter what it is. It's not easy, but it's possible. And for us to, because he enables us. He enables us because he's given us the greatest helper that could ever be. Who is the one that's been called to walk alongside you? He's the one that's your coach. You know, sometimes players, sports people, they have the skill. But without a proper coach, they cannot amount to much. But we have the best coach. His name is the Holy Spirit. And all we need to do is to ask him. So as we close this morning, I want to say you have been redeemed from the curse. And you're going to go back and read what the curse means. But I want you to know the blessing of God is yours. There was an exchange on that cross. And that blessing, God wants you and I to enjoy it. And I believe that the legal part, the price has been paid, but we need to experience it every day of our lives. You see, when you wake up, it's another day of victory. Another day of victory. Even if you feel like you are so defeated. <laughs> you know what? As a man thinks in his head, his heart so is he. I wake up saying, another day of victory. Amen. Sometimes victory looks one million miles away. But as God, as the light shines on the day, you know, God begins to, to walk and victory is unveiled. Amen? Because our God never fails. Our God never fails. If he says you are free, you are free. And have you one, ever wondered why some believers are more blessed than others? 
Not a trick question. Is it because of their spiritual performance? The hours spent reading the word of God? Because sometimes we look at some Christians and say, ah, he's got it made up because they are constantly reading the Bible or they are constantly praying. That's part of it. But that's not the whole thing. Or because they fast so much. You know, when I was growing up as a Christian, anybody who said he was fasting, I wanted to follow them. And I got into more trouble. I was just getting slimmer and slimmer and thinner and thinner because I was doing it in the flesh. And I wanted to be like, you know, that apostle who was, who say, who fasted for X number of days and then he heard God. And every time I plunged into that, he was, boy. But the answer is that people are blessed because they actually believe God. They believe God has justified them. They believe what happened on the cross, that all the good that was due to Jesus became theirs, and all the bad that was theirs became Jesus's. And it's called a divine exchange. And on that cross, the love of God was fully expressed. I'm going to listen to a song in a minute as we close our service to take us back to what Jesus did for us on the cross. And when you look back to what he did, and remember it's for you, and you say, Holy Spirit, show me how to make the most of this. It's called the grace of God. It's you learning to receive what you don't deserve because grace has made it available to you. I'd like to, to listen to this song and then we'll pray together. The song is called, Here is Love. And why it's coming up, it says, Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember? Who can cease to sing his praise? He can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the Mount of Crucifixion, fountains opened deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast, flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above and heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. So as I wait for that to, to come up, just remember the curse doesn't have to hold you back from enjoying the full blessings of God. Let's say this together. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe you are the son of God and the only way to God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again from the dead. I renounce all my sins and I turn to you, Lord Jesus, for mercy and for forgiveness. And I believe that you do forgive me. From now on, I am going to continue to live for you. I've been reminded that what you went through was not because of your sin, but because of my sin. You took upon my sin, you took upon the punishment due to my sin. And today, I can walk free. I want to hear your voice and do what you tell me to do. Through faith in Jesus Christ, I have been saved by the grace of God. I did, not, I did not earn this grace. It's a precious gift that God has given me. He's given me what I don't deserve. He's given me his favor, his life, his joy. And I will live in the good of this the rest of my days. Help me, God. In Jesus' name. Amen.